Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we're going to be completing the novel Dune by Frank Herbert. The third part of the novel is called Book 3 The Prophet. For the first two part of the books there will be a link in the upper right corner or at the end of the video. And you can do me a favor if you haven't subscribed please consider doing so. Give us a like, drop us a comment. Now let's get on with it. Baron Vladimir Harkonnen floated into the servants chambers angry that the captain of his guard did not check the slave boy who was sent in to his bedchamber. He then demanded of the captain to know where his nephew Fyodorovna is and got upset when the captain could only tell him that he was in the slave quarters but not where in the slave quarters that he was. That's when Fiyed Ruther walked into the room. That's when the Baron realized that Fiyed had his own spy system that was focused on the Baron. The Baron said there's a body in my chambers that I wished removed. When Fiyed nodded to two guards and they rushed off to do it, that's when the Baron realized that those two was working for Fiyed. Fiyed told the Baron that he was playing chiaps with a slave master all the while he was wondering what went wrong. His uncle should be dead. The boy was perfect. The Baron then asked Fiyed if he won the game. Fiyed said yes. Then the Baron turned to his guard captain and said, take three men and go to the slave master and kill him and bring his body to me when you're finished so I can see that it was done properly. Fiyed now was very nervous. Just then, the two guards passed by carrying the body. The Baron saw them and then told the captain to add those two to your list. I don't like the way they carry that body. He then told Fiyed to accompany him to his chambers. Fiyed went all this time wondering if he's going to get killed while the Baron told him about the new prophet that is on Arrakis that they call Muadib. When they got to his chambers, the Baron told Fiyed that it was a clever plan but not clever enough. Then he asked him why didn't he do it himself. He answered the Baron, you taught me that my own hands must remain clean. The Baron told him, I'll make a bargain with you. If Fayed stops those attempts on his life, when he, the Baron, retires, he will leave Fayed in charge. In return for accepting the bargain, the Baron will not kill him. Apparently, the way Fayed tried to kill the Baron was that there was a needle implanted in the slave boy's thigh that when the Baron touched his thigh, it would prick him and poison would kill him. The Baron then told him he was going to have Hawat watch him that they have total control of Hawat because they will keep giving him the antidote. The Baron then ordered him to go down to the slave quarters and with his own two hand kill all the women in the pleasure ring. Then the Baron met with Hawat and Hawat came up with a plan to use Arrakis the way the Emperor uses Salusa Segundas, his prison planet, to create his fighting force of Sadaukar. They're going to set Raban up to take the fall. He's in charge of Arrakis and they're going to squeeze him so that he has to increase the oppression on Arrakis which then turns Arrakis into Salusa Segundas for them. Then when the price production begins to fall they will be able to step in and take over under the guise of fixing things. Howard still believes that Jessica is the one who betrayed the Atreides. Paul Moadib was drifting in his mind between the past, the present and his prescience. Not sure what was real. Once he came out of that state he remembered where he was and that today was the day he'd have to ride the maker. His son Leto was with his mother and his sister Alea and Shawnee was here with him. There's some problems with some of the people because of his sister Alea who has the powers of a reverend mother although she's still a little child. Some of the women think she's a witch. The time finally came and the ritual was performed and Paul placed a thumper in the sand and activated it to call the worm. When it came, it was the largest one he had ever seen. It was half a league long. He stepped into its path and got ready. Jessica was to the south, wondering if Paul had completed his sand rider test yet and dealing with her two-year-old daughter, Alia. They were there together with Hara, who was fiercely protective of Alia. When Alia began to cry, saying she knows that she's a freak, Hara said, that she is not to say that anymore, that she is not a freak. Then she had Aaliyah tell her everything she remembers so that she could explain it to the people. Then Aaliyah began to explain everything she remembered from the time before she was born. While she was speaking, word came to them that the young men are waiting until Paul passes his sand rider test to force him to lead them into battle against the Harkonnens. 
Paul completed his sand rider test, climbing up onto the back of the sandworm. Then, once he was up there, the others of his troop climbed up behind him. Just as Paul said for them to go south, they saw Omnihopter, and it landed and they watched it. And then they prepared to attack the smugglers to show them that this was Freeman land. Gunny Harlock was in the smuggler spice factory directing things. He brought his smugglers this far south because the Harkonnens didn't come this far south, but he was a bit worried because this was Freeman territory. When Gunny and his men got down and began to harvest the spice, that's when the Freeman erupted around them. They were suddenly surrounded and fighting. And then the leader faced off with him and told him, leave the knife in his sheet, Gunny Harlech. It wasn't until Paul took off his hood and pulled his filter aside that Gunny recognized him. Gunny told him they said you were dead. Paul responded, it seemed the best protection to let them think so. Gunny Harlech warned Paul that there were men in the smuggler group that could not be trusted. Those men were Sadakar. Later when they were in a cave, those Sadakar attacked but were defeated and two of them were kept prisoner after they gave their word. Gunny Harlech still believes that Jessica is the one that betrayed the Atreides and still plans to kill her once Paul learns the truth. The reason the Fremen was that a leader was challenged, they fight, and then if he loses, the winner takes his place. So Paul, Jessica, and Stilgar came up with a plan, and Paul had to give his speech. And at the end of that speech, he had his army, and he had Stilgar at his right hand. Later, when Gunny met Jessica, he held her at knife point, but Paul was able to convince him that it was Dr. Yue that was the traitor. And Paul, because he did not see this coming, this is when he decided to take the waters of life. If he lived, he would be the Kwasatz Haderach. After taking the waters of life, Paul was unconscious for three weeks. Jessica finally called for Chani when she didn't know what else to do. When Chani came, she put just a dab of the water of life under his nose and Paul woke up, surprised that he was out for three weeks. To him, it was just a moment. He looked into the now and he saw that the space above Arrakis was filled with ships of the guild. The Padisha Emperor was there and his favorite truthsayer and five legions of Sadakar. The old Baron Vladimir Harkonnen was there with Tafur Hawat and seven ships jammed with every conscript he could muster. Every great house has its raiders above us waiting. When Jessica asks what are they waiting for, Paul says for the guild's permission to land. The guild will strand on Arrakis any force that lands without permission. When Jessica asks if the guild is protecting us, Paul said no. The guild itself caused this by spreading tales about what we do here and by reducing troop transport fares to the point where even the poorest houses are up there now looking to loot us. He then told Jessica to change a quantity of water for them, that they needed a catalyst. He asked them, do you know what will happen if we plant a quantity of the water of life above a pre-spice mass? It will spread throughout Arrakis, and Arrakis will become a true desolation without spice or maker. Then he told them, he who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. We can destroy the spice. He said that the guild dare not interfere because to interfere was to lose what they must have. But now they are desperate. All paths lead to darkness. The Fremen had captured or isolated all of the cities on Arrakis except for Arrakeen which lay behind the shield wall around which they had gathered. Paul is timing his attack with a great storm that is expected to hit the shield wall. Just as the attack started, he got a message that his son Leto was dead and his sister was captured. In the Emperor's encampment in the city of Arakin, the Emperor was berating the Baron Harkonnen. He brought up Aaliyah and said this is the sister of Moadib. The Reverend Mother saw Aaliyah standing in her mind. Aaliyah said she allowed herself to be captured. The Reverend Mother screamed for someone to kill Aaliyah. Then the whole room shook as Paul used atomics to breach the shield wall. And the Fremen came through, riding on the backs of giant worms. Aaliyah then said, I told you, my brother comes. The Emperor said that they will retreat to space and reform. And then pointed at Aaliyah and said, give her body to the storm. Aaliyah then pretended to be afraid and backed into the Baron, who felt he had captured her. When she stuck him with a gum jabbar, saying, 
I'm sorry, grandfather, you have met the Atreides Gamjaba. The Baron died, and before the Emperor's ship could take off, it was disabled. As another shot blasted open the double doors, Alia escaped through it. That's when the two guildsmen standing next to the Emperor said, We cannot know how it will go, but this Moadib cannot know either. The Emperor then told the Reverend Mother, We must devise a plan. Then he called for Count Fenring. They knew they had only one weapon left, and that was treachery. Now that Paul was victorious, he went to the old Atreides home in Arakim. He then invited the Emperor and his entourage to join him in the house. He had saw beforehand that the Emperor had given Hawat a poison needle with which to strike him down. So he went straight to Hawat, but Hawat had no intention of killing an Atreides, and he preferred to die first, and he did. He then ordered the two guildsmen to have their ships leave Arrakis. At first they resisted, but when he threatened to destroy all of the spies on Arrakis, they realized he meant it, and they obeyed. He then spoke to the Emperor's reverend mother, Trudseer, telling her that he could kill her with a word after demonstrating his power. He then called out Fied Ruther Hakonin, who immediately challenged him to Kinley. They fought single combat with Fied using the Emperor's knife, which was poisoned. Fied also had a poison pin in his hip. In the fight, Paul was scratched with the knife, but he was able to neutralize the poison the Bene Gesserit way. But then Fied fell to the floor and the pin got stuck in the floor and before he could move, Paul drove his knife up into his brain, killing him. The Emperor then asked Count Fenring to kill Paul. Count Fenring was the only person that Paul could not see with his prescience. And Paul finally figured out why he couldn't see Fenring, because Fenring was a might have been an almost quasiat tarak crippled by a single flaw in the genetic pattern. His talent allowed him to hide from those with prescience. Count Fenring told the Emperor that he must refuse. This angered the Emperor who went across and cuffed Fenring across the jaw. Fenring then told the Emperor, We have been friends, Majesty. What I do now is out of friendship. I will forget that you struck me. The Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam glimpsed the truth in Paul's words and she glimpsed the jihad to come and she said you cannot lose these people on the universe. Paul told her, you will think back to the gentle ways of the Sadakar. Jessica and Shani would negotiate the terms. What Paul wanted was the Emperor's entire charm company holdings and the fief of Caladan. And he was going to give titles and attendant power to every surviving Atreides man. So Paul was to marry the Princess Ilulan and ascend the throne. The last thing Jessica told Shani was that, think of it. That princess will have the name, yet she will live as less than a concubine, never to know a moment's tenderness from the man she is bound to. While we, Shani, who carry the name concubine, history will call us wives. And that is how the book ends. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe, give us a like, and drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.